Now we get to move on to the chi-squared chi tests. In this video, we'll talk about just the fundamentals of chi-squared and then the first of three tests, this one being the goodness of fit test. To begin with, I have to remind ourselves that I showed you guys uh, a little while ago um, four different probability distributions. We've talked about normal distribution, T distribution uh, quite extensively. We're now going into the chi-squared probability distribution, uh, which looks like this. And we talked a little bit about uh, the degree of freedom changing uh, the shape of the chi-squared distribution. Uh, but it is a probability distribution. So there are some things that uh, are the same as all the other ones, like the area is one. This one, however, always begins at zero, except for when the degree of freedom is one, but all other times, this point is always at zero, which is important, actually, because our chi-squared statistics is then uh, just the x-coordinate, which is very convenient. The chi-squared is uh, always skewed right, and as we've seen up here, as the degree of freedom increases, it approaches symmetry, uh, although is never actually symmetric. Uh, just like in z-tests and t-tests, we're of course going to have to verify that it's okay to use the chi-square distribution. Uh, here are the three points of verification. It has to be independent, simple random sample. All, right, all expected counts are at least one. And then this is the one that's a little, a little cumbersome in terms of wordage no more than 20% of the expected counts are less than five. I tend to like to think of it the other way around, which is that at least 80% of the expected counts should be five or more. Somehow that makes more sense to me. But either one, it's, it's the same. Now, we have to actually get into what chi-squared is really doing for us. And that really pivots around Oops, actually, I forgot. Yeah, there's this exception, of course. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, table uh, of values. Uh, and if it's a two by two, all four of them, because a two by two table will have four uh, numbers in it, should be greater than five. All right, now let's get back to what does chi-squared really do? And it pivots around this word counts. What we're going to be doing uh, is in chi-squared tests, we analyze the difference between uh, observed counts and what was expected. There's a couple other things that I want to just sort of talk about for chi-squared, right? The, one of the other big things that, we, that is the difference between chi-squared and Z and T tests is that we're actually analyzing the entire distribution. In a Z or T test, it's just one number, either a mean or a proportion. But here, we get to actually analyze an entire distribution. And the other cool thing about chi-squared, which is different than Z and t-tests, is it can analyze categorical data. Or Z and t-tests, it's always numeric data. So let's look at an example. Uh, oh, <laughs> before we look at an example, uh, we have to actually go back and figure out how are we actually going to calculate this chi-squared statistic? It's actually not very easy to read chi-squared. There we are. Because just like Z and T tests, ultimately we're going to find the probability for the null hypothesis, which is going to be this area. We're going to use uh, a chi-squared CDF function. So this is a coordinate. How do we calculate it? And there's a formula, which is this. And you can see it's all based on observed counts, the difference between observed counts and expected counts. And it's actually a, a ratio number, so of a relative frequency, although this is a, a squared quantity. So what that means is actually, can chi-squared ever be negative? Well, because this is squared, numerator will always be positive. Uh, expected counts, it's really unlikely that you'd ever expect less than zero of anything. So chi-squared is really always positive, which is why, you know, this is zero, chi-squared values are 
always positive. Now, we're also going to need to calculate degree of freedom, uh, which is just your n minus 1. But n in this case is a little different than what we've had for t distributions. Uh, n is not really the sample size, as we'll see in a, the next example. But it's actually the number of ex expected counts that were calculated. That's at least I find the easiest way to, to think about n. Uh, let's look at example number one. We'll do two examples. This one's fairly simple. It's the roll of a die. All right? And we roll a die 65 times. And ultimately the question is, is it a fair die? Well, here's our results. All right? 65 times. It came up with one on the die 15 times, and 12 times we saw two, and nine times we saw three, and eight times we saw four. And the question is, is it, is it a loaded die? Is it weighted? So that you know, maybe one looks like it's maybe more probable than the other ones. Well, maybe, maybe not. Uh, the frequencies, of course, these are our observed counts. This is how many times it happened. Now, if it were a fair die, if we're assuming that it was a fair die, then each outcome is equally likely. And we expect to see a one, one sixth of the 65 rolls, same with the two and the three, because they're equally likely. Which means we would expect to see each one 10.83 times. And you know, it doesn't make too much sense. We can't see one's 10.8 uh, times. But for our chi-squared calculations, we can keep the decimal. And those are our expected counts. We would expect to see each outcome the same number of times. This is sort of our theoretical ideal. Since we have observed and expected counts, we can now start our process. And it's going to be the same four-step process that we used for Z and T tests. Step one, we have questions and tests. All right, is it a fair die? We have our test, chi-squared test for goodness of fit. All right, and we can talk a little bit more about what this goodness of fit means. All right, here we have our theoretical counts. How well do these actual observed counts fit the theory? All right. That's what it means by goodness of fit. Now, the other two, just so that I can kind of seed these ideas, Right. We can use chi-squared for what's called homogeneity of populations. Are populations the same? And we can also use chi-squared to establish association and independence. But those will be the next two videos. Now, we of course need to verify our distribution. Here are our three points of verification. We have our expected counts. So, of course, in fact, two and three are pretty easy, right? One, right, they are independent, and they are, essentially represents a simple random sample of all possible roles. So, it's verified as chi-squared. We can get our hypotheses, right? Of course, just as before, null hypothesis means there's no difference. This is a fair die. The observed difference is, you know, this 15, and this 8 and 9, that's just normal, expected, random variation. Really, there's nothing going on here. All right, alternate hypothesis, hypothesis is that it is a way to die. Something is you know, wrong here. The observed distribution of outcomes is different than the distribution that is expected. Right. Now we can get to the fun part. We can calculate our p-value. All right, remember, this is our chi-squared, this is how we get chi-squared. We need two things to get our probability, and that's chi-squared and degree of freedom. So what I'm going to do is put these into my L1 and L2 lists and use this formula in L3, and it'll look something like this. All right, here's L1, here's L2. Formula for L3 is this formula. And here are all the individual components of chi-squared. But this big capital sigma means, of course, summation. 
So in order to get chi squared, we have to sum L3, which means it's 2.846. The next thing, of course, is what's the degree of freedom? N minus 1 is how we calculate it. And this is where we have to be careful about N. All right? In a sense, we rolled the die 65 times. So our sample size is 65, but that's not really what N is for chi squared. How many expected counts did we calculate? There are six of them. So that's N. And so we have five degrees of freedom. Once we have that, we can look at our chi-squared distribution, and we can map on our chi-squared of 2.846, and we know that this is going to be the area that we're looking for. We can now use our chi-squared CDF function. I've given you the syntax here, lower bound, upper bound, degree of freedom. So I put in 2.846 for my lower bound. There is no upper bound, so I use just a really big number. And five degrees of freedom. And it should look like that. Now, just to show you where that is on the calculator, all right, we go second distribution. And just like our normal CDF, you know, TCDF, if we scroll down, chi-squared PDF, and there's chi-squared CDF, which is eight. Lower bound is going to be our 2.846, sorry. Our upper bound, I used 1,000, and degree of freedom is five. It gives us our equation, if we want to look at the whole thing. All right, here's our chi-squared CDF function. I hit the arrow button a few too many times. Come on, there we go. Hit enter, and we get our point seven two four if you round it properly. Okay. Now if you were to change oh, come on this to five hundred instead of a thousand probably shouldn't really be much different. In fact it's not at all different. So we could have used five hundred I suppose. Again it's such a big number there's so little area out here that it doesn't make too much difference. So that's the chi-squared CDF function. And now we can move on to step four and interpret some significance. So with a 72.4% chance of drawing the sample, there is insufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis. Therefore, I conclude that whatever differences may exist, that we talked about, like this 15 and the 8, so much different than those. That really, those are just due to random behavior, and it is, in fact, a fair die. We're going to do a second example now, because uh, with all of these different chi-squared tests, really it comes down to how do you calculate the expected counts. And so it's important to see a couple different versions uh, that can be thrown at you. So we have uh, s example two. Some claim that the U.S. population is getting older. Below is U.S. census data from 1980 over here. And the results of a simple random sample of 500, which is here, in 1996. Is there sufficient evidence that the demographics of the U.S. population is aging. So, of course, we have our step one, is the population getting older? We have chi-squared test for goodness of fit. We, of course, are going to have to verify. All right. To do this verification, we need our expected counts. So I just made some space here 
and we'll figure out what our expected counts are. Now, to do our expected counts, we kind of have to think about the null hypothesis, although we're not quite up to step two yet. Of course, our null hypothesis is going to be that 1996 is the same as 1980. And so we can use that as our theory, as our model. And so we can use 1980 and say, well, based on 1980, what should the counts be for a sample of 500? All right, so what we can do is we'll get our percentages from 1980 and then our expected counts based on those. All right, we add up our census data. All right, to get the percentage, we do you know, 93,777 divided by 226,546. And we can get all those just by doing that divided by that, that divided by that, that divided by that. And now to go from percentages to counts, for a sample 500, we of course would multiply all four of these by 500. And if we multiplied by 500, we'd get those. So here are the expected counts, assuming that there is no real change from 1980 to 1996. And you can see that these are slightly different, but is that difference due to expected random chance or is it significant? But now that we have our expected counts, we can complete the verification. All right. We're told that it was a simple random sample, so that's easy. And of course, all the counts are not just greater than one, but they're all greater than five. So verified that chi-squared is a fine test to use. We have our hypothesis, which I've already more or less talked about. And now let's calculate our p-value. Right. Here's our chi-squared test. Again, to calculate p, we need chi-squared and our degree of freedom. Here are the expected counts. Here's the observed. All right. Notice that I had to kind of, you know, it's, it's always observed minus expected. So I had to do L2 minus L1. But as long as you kind of pay attention to where observed is and where expected is, you know, no problem. Here are component parts. And we sum them up. And we get our chi-squared of 8.214. We need degree of freedom which is, of course, n minus 1. And, of course, again, you know, in a sense, our sample size you know, is, is 500. But we only calculated four expected values. So n is 4. Degree of freedom is 3. We can map on to our chi-squared curve, 8.214. Notice that, actually, if, if you notice, this is identical to the last curve in the last example. You know, is, did I actually put this in an accurate location? Not really. I just did sort of a, a visualization here. And it doesn't really make it, because we're not doing it graphically. We're using the chi-squared CDF function. I just want to visualize that it's, you know, this area to the right. And we can, of course, use our chi-squared CDF. And this time, I used 500. Seems like that would maybe be uh, adequate. And we get our probability, which means now we can interpret the significance. And with a 4.18% chance of drawing this distribution, there is sufficient evidence at the 5% significance level to reject the null hypothesis. Therefore, I conclude that the age distribution in 1996 is different than in 1980. Now, this is actually kind of important here, you know, notice that I said different. I didn't say older, right? Is it getting older? That's, you know, the chi-squared test itself just says it's different. Maybe it's younger, who knows, right? It's essentially, if we think about it in terms of like a Z or T test, chi-squared is always two-tail. It doesn't tell you direction. So we have to get to the direction and magnitude another way. And the way we do this is actually, in this case, by looking at the chi-squared components. And I'm going to make a little space. I'm going to move the, uh, the step four over to the left a little bit. There we go. 
And by looking at these components of chi-squared, we can say that the greatest change is a reduction in the youngest age group. Now, how did I know that? Right, because this is the largest component of chi-squared. So that means it's the most different. So the biggest change came from the youngest group, 0 to 24. Uh, and, and, it, and we know that it was a reduction. Oops. Right. And we know that by looking at these numbers. Right. This actually reduced from the expected values. It went down to what it sh you know, would have been if it had stayed the same. So this gives you direction. This kind of gives you magnitude. Now, the next largest change is an increase in the next age group. All right, next largest change, here's the next biggest component of chi-squared. But this, right, this was reduction, this was increase. Right, by looking at the counts, we can see the, the direction. And you'll notice that those two are fairly small, so there was not really a whole lot of change in these upper two counts. So that's why I say the top two age groups did not experience as much change. Between the ages of 0 and 44, there has been an upward shift, but there has been no significant shift in the 44 or older ages. So we have uh, an interpretation of so magnitude and direction, which the basic chi-squared test actually can't give you. We have to sort of go one step farther and look at the components and look at the, the counts and see what direction it's going in. That is the end of those two uh, examples. The next video will move on to the next type of chi-squared test.